In 1954, my eldest brother was appointed to start a new religious class and a church in a small village. Being an active young man with a rare passion for bicycles, my brother combined his primary assignments with bicycle repair in the village and surrounding communities where most successful farmers had bicycles. About a year later, my brother was brought to our village on a bicycle with a badly swollen knee and a protruding thread-like worm which was diagnosed locally as guinea worm. Out of frustration and in intense pain, my brother pulled the worm by force as if to draw it out. The fragile worm was cut in two, and one part withdrew into his tissue. The swelling and pain became so intense and unbearable that he was incapacitated and could not work for more than three months. There have been many endlings over the course of natural history. In deep time, extinctions are a fact of life, the inevitable consequences of large-scale forces resetting the planet's systems. But in near time, extinctions can be, and often are, the product of our choices. And while you might be thinking that we should always choose to avert an extinction, the reality is, sometimes we plan them. And maybe that's a good thing. The story of guinea worm starts with microscopic larvae swimming in a pond. Those larvae get eaten by a copepod, a type of tiny crustacean. Inside the copepod, the larvae molt twice. Then that copepod, with its larval passengers, is scooped up in a cupped hand or a water jug and consumed by a thirsty person. In their stomach, the copepod dies, freeing the worms, and it only gets worse from here. The worms burrow through the stomach and the walls of the intestines, making their way into the person's abdominal cavity to mature into adults and mate. The males die afterward, while the females begin to migrate downward to the person's legs and feet. About a year after their unfortunate sip of water, the infected person will notice a painful burning blister forming where the female worm has come to the surface of their skin. To try to relieve that pain, they stick their blistered foot into a body of water. The female then releases her larva through the skin into the pond, and the cycle begins again. What's left behind is a meter-long worm that must be slowly extracted over the course of weeks by winding her body around a stick or a piece of gauze, being careful not to pull too hard. If the worm breaks and can't be fully removed, it can cause incredibly painful inflammation and potentially secondary infections. And this horrifying sequence of events has probably been happening to people for a long time. We know it's been happening for at least 3,570 years because the method of extracting the worm by winding it around a stick is mentioned in an ancient Egyptian collection of medical writings called the Ebers Papyrus. And just over 500 years later, we have physical evidence of a guinea worm infection in the form of a worm preserved inside a mummified woman. It's even potentially been represented visually, with a worm emerging from the thigh of a saint in a painting on an altarpiece from southern Italy dating to around the year 1500. And guinea worm disease used to happen in at least 21 countries in Asia and Africa, from Pakistan to Senegal, with an estimated 3.5 million cases in 1986. But in 2024, it only happened in two countries, Chad and South Sudan, for a total of just 15 human cases. And I think it's pretty safe to say we'd rather it happen in none at all. This is the journey we've been on since 1980, the quest to get rid of guinea worm disease permanently. Which is possible in theory. Humanity has eradicated two pathogens before, smallpox and rinderpest. We have caused the, quote, permanent reduction to zero of the worldwide incidence of infection caused by them as a result of deliberate efforts such that intervention measures are no longer needed. And that is what eradication means, technically. But these viruses are not actually extinct because they do still exist as samples in labs, as frozen endlings of a sort, I guess, assuming you think viruses are alive in the first place, which many scientists don't. But we have stopped their reproduction, making them functionally extinct for the moment, and we could choose to cause their extinction by destroying those samples. And both of these viruses were good candidates for eradication because they had three things in common. First, they were easily detectable. The symptoms of smallpox were obvious and distinctive, and lab tests existed to confirm rinderpest once animals started to show signs of the disease. 
Second, there was an effective way to stop their transmission, vaccination. A vaccine against smallpox was even the first vaccine ever to be developed in 1796. And third, there was no source of these viruses in the wild that could reinfect people or animals once eradication had been achieved. But guinea worm doesn't fit this profile. It is easily detectable, at least once the worm has started to emerge, but there's no vaccine and its larvae exist out there in the ponds of the world. So why do we think we can get rid of it? And since we're not dealing with a virus here, but a nematode, an organism that's a member of the animal kingdom, are we talking about eradication or are we planning an actual extinction? The first question is actually relatively easy to answer. We know how to stop transmission. Whether we can stop all transmission is a different story. Stopping transmission starts with preventing infection. Clean water either needs to be provided to people who would otherwise have to drink potentially contaminated water, or the contaminated water needs to be filtered or treated to kill guinea worm larvae. Public health education is also an important component, as is community engagement. Local buy-in is critical for creating and enacting plans that are likely to work in that specific place. In cases where a person is already infected, containment is critical. And there are particular criteria that have to be met for a case to be considered contained. But they basically come down to identifying patients quickly, making sure they receive proper care and education, and treating all potentially contaminated water sources to kill any larva. But there are some complications. It was once thought that this species of guinea worm only infected humans and only through drinking contaminated water. And this might not be true after all. It turns out domestic dogs, cats, and some baboons can also play host to worms, making containment much harder, though not impossible. This is mostly a problem in domestic dogs in Chad and countries that border it. They become infected by eating raw fish or other aquatic animals that can transport larvae, but aren't hosts that the worms can mature inside of. Keeping domestic dogs and cats in areas with known guinea worm infections from roaming freely has been the strategy used for containment for these new challenges. But say we were able to stop all guinea worm infections, which may be harder than we thought, though we have made it a reality in all but two countries. This brings us back to the second question I asked earlier. Are we talking about eradicating a disease or are we planning the extinction of an animal? In this case, I'd say both, and the disease is gonna go first but not by much. Guinea worm larvae can only survive in the water for around three days without a host and can only live inside of their copepod host for about two weeks. Assuming perfect case containment in both humans and animals, within a month, there would be no more larvae or infected copepods left. The only worms remaining would be those inside of people. In about a year or a little more, the final emergence would begin. The larva carried by that worm could be released into something like a bucket of water, reducing the size of the worm and making its removal from its human host easier. As long as that bucket was dumped on dry ground, far from water sources, that would spell the end of the larvae. And guinea worms have to be alive while they're being extracted, so there would be a moment when the endling was removed from its human host, which would mark the end of guinea worm disease, a clear win for humankind. But what happens to the worm itself? We couldn't find any accounts exactly of what happens after a worm is extracted. One source just said the worm is discarded. Presumably, it doesn't live long after extraction, and I'm not sure anyone's tried to find out. But that is the fate we have planned for the hypothetical guinea worm endling. And this is perhaps the first time we have planned out an actual global extinction. We've certainly known others were coming, like the dusky seaside sparrow and the Pinta Island tortoise, whose endlings were named Orange Band and Lonesome George, respectively. But in those cases, we were trying to prevent them. We've also gotten rid of species from specific places, like the New World screw worm in North America, at least for now. And we're planning to do it again, like with Aotearoa New Zealand's Predator Free 2050 project. This is called extirpation. And some biologists have proposed causing the extinction of certain kinds of disease-carrying mosquitoes, but we've never actually gone through with it. With guinea worm, though, we're getting really close, and what it will mean is an end to a particular kind of human suffering. Ultimately, evolution and extinction are two of the biggest forces that shape life on our planet, and our fight against guinea worm is part of both. Guinea worm has evolved an incredibly complex life cycle that requires multiple hosts and a long time to complete. 
And we humans have developed behavioral countermeasures using our big brains and technological capabilities that are also products of evolution. This is, in a sense, a classic example of an arms race between a parasite and its host. The only difference is that we just happen to be participants who can think about our role in that process. Endlings is filmed in the Harry Plumley studio and was made possible by hundreds of you who supported our Kickstarter. Thank you so very much. We really could not have done this without you.